Welcome back to part four, where we're finally going to put this job system together in our code. Let's go into the code and remember what we've done before in our update, because this is where we're going to make a lot of the modifications. We're replacing this for loop in the update, which is looping through all of our cubes that are in our array. And instead of doing them one by one and one after the other, we're going to parallel process them by pushing through the job system. Now this is where you need to have a flattened array and why we flattened out our array was that two lectures ago or the first lecture whenever it was. So I went to a lot of effort to explain the flattened arrays and it doesn't matter how you conceptually want to think about your arrays if you want a 3D or 2D that's fine but when you go to use the job system they have to be flattened because you don't see the for loop in the job system. You see one method, and as far as you're concerned, it's processing one thing. Okay, so let's do that. Right, we're going to grab the code that's inside our for loop here. So we're going to take this out of here, and I'll just control exit, and we're going to go up into the execute method that's inside of our struct and just paste it into there. Now we've still got an I. The execute is executing for one cube and it does it for every single cube that you've put into your access uh, transform array thing that we set up before and it already has I as it comes through here. And so the job system itself is actually passing through the index for you. And then it can just do whatever was in the for loop. So we've completely removed the for loop and instead replaced it in the execute. Now we've got all of these variables inside of this struct that we need to pass through values for. So you can see that they're all got the little red squiggly line underneath them, which means that this struct actually doesn't know about them whatsoever. So what we will do is pass them through. So just above where you've got that execute, we're just going to declare these values that we can give to our struct. So we have our height, our width, number of layers, and our X offset and our Z offset. We don't need the Y offset because we're calculating that inside of execute. You can see it here. The other thing that we need to get rid of is this cubes. Remember I said that this execute runs for every single cube that you put into that transform array. And so by the time this part of the code runs, we actually don't even need any of that there whatsoever. So this is running on each cube or four each cube. So inside here, it knows which cube it's referring to automatically. So this is all now set up and ready to go. All we need to do is create an instance of this struct and start it running. So let's go down into the update and we're going to get rid of what was left over of our for loop and also this offset stuff up here. So let's get rid of that and we will replace it with this. We're creating a instance of our position update job struct. So cube job, which we declared much earlier on at the top of our code, we're setting that to be a new position update job. At the same time, we're setting all of those public values that are inside it. So if we just scroll up there, these ones here inside that struct, are these ones here on the left. In this case, our values that we've got as globals and whatnot hanging around in our code are called exactly the same thing. So it's not really clear which is which, but these ones on the left are the ones that all belong to the struct and we're setting them with these values here. So for example, if our height were like 150, we could actually just hard code things in like that to set the struct values themselves. If 
but let's just go back so that we can stick with what comes in from the inspector there. Now, the Z offset, I've just left it to be based on the position at the moment as we were using before um, because it's this X offset that we're using to scroll around. You'll see I've still got this global thing declared outside and then we're just going to update it by one each time. So it will give you that sort of waving, scrolling looking thing happening. Okay, so this is creating the job. It's not running it. It's just creating it ready to go. So let's just go down a little bit and then we'll add in this here. So what this is doing is getting the cube job that we've just created and scheduling it to run, passing through the cube transform access array. So this is our array that we filled up with all of the transforms that it always has hold of and we don't need to take them in or out. So we know that it just has hold of all of the cubes that we're working with, which makes life so much easier if the job system can just update their positions and we don't have to muck around with changing them from one array to the other and back again and all that type of thing. So the schedule scheduler of the job is going to make it actually run and this is the handle that holds onto it for us so that we can check on its progress and we can do other things with it. You could schedule it without a handle but then you've got no idea where that job is, where it's up to and how it's running through the system. So it's always good to make sure that you've got a hold of it with something. That's all that you need inside of the update. After that, we'll add two more methods just down in here. And one is late update and the other is on destroy. What's going on in late update? Remember late update happens in the Unity um, main loop cycle thingy that's going on last. And what you want it to do in here is to not loop around again until you get this complete going on. Now, what the complete does is it will sit and wait until the job, given the handle, has finished running, which is running in the background. And that will then uh, force it to wait before it then goes and gets another frame. I've also added in an on destroy which is going to clean up our memory when the object gets destroyed or when you stop playing. So you have to, with the job system, make sure that you manually dispose of things that you've created and you might do them elsewhere, not just on a destroy, but when you have finished with them, if you have more extensive code. And you can see here that it's just the transform access array dot dispose to free up that memory. And that's it. Save your code. Let's switch back into the editor. We'll press play. Now I've still got my landscape set up. Let's just remind ourselves of width of 150, height of 150 with layers of two. And this is the same as before so that I can compare the performance with what we took before. So to do that, while this is running, let's go back into window and pull up our profiler which is just there. And we want to go in and find our update, behavior update, our Perl and scroller. Now let's have a look at the CPU usage for this. And look, 1.0, 1.2, 1 1.6. What was it before? If I remember rightly, it was like 10% and now it's down to 1%. So we have dramatically dropped the uh, amount of CPU load just by implementing that job system. And that is such a powerful concept using that parallel processing for this. So this, the, this is the end of the tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it. Just one thing I need to point out to you is the way that that job system works. And let's just go back to that code because I really need to emphasize this is this execute here. Remember this execute is only one of your cubes. One of the things that you've put into that flattened array being processed within here, okay? It doesn't have access to its neighbor. It doesn't have access to one that's like 10 down the track. As far as this is kind of concerned, that array doesn't even exist. 
And that's the whole point of parallel processing is that you've got to work with values and things that are independent of each other. You can't be sort of trying to get the neighboring values for something and then integrating them in. And this works just so perfectly with Perl and Noise because Perl and Noise is a continuous mathematical function that can be calculated anywhere along its length and no value is dependent on any other value around it. So whatever you do with this job system, always be aware of that, that as far as the execute is concerned, the thing that is doing all of this fantastic magic for us, it's only aware that one instance of anything exists, even though there might be like 500 executes running at one time, they can't see each other and they're not allowed to access each other because you can't mess around with um, sort of cross memory, computer memory elements. Um, when one thing's doing something, you can't have another process somewhere else running at exactly the same time, accessing it and mucking around with it because you don't know what kind of corruption you're going to cause between those two sides. So that's really important. Okay, so that's it. I hope you really enjoyed this and it gave you a bit of a taste for trying out this parallel processing. And I hope I'll get it some time to put up some more tutorials on this. Thanks for watching. Please support the development of more superb online learning content by subscribing. And as always, visit holistic3d.com to learn more about awesome games development books and tutorials.